Okay, we better start now. Uh, about 76 people joined us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, on behalf of Africa Message System Team, African the Accelerate Genetic Gen for Maze Project Management and Maze CRP, kindly welcome you to all this webinar. I took the responsibility of coordinating this webinar. I am Adafris, working for CIMIT on Highland Maze Breeding and Sea System based at CIMIT Ethiopia. Before going to the presentation, we'd like to mention three webinar modalities. Uh, the first is uh, except for presenters, all microphones are muted. We also insist to put your off the video cameras, uh, just internet, there is a, a competition in bandwidth of internet. Participants are encouraged to write questions in the chat box and presenters, CIMIT staff, as well as webinar participants, you can answer or you are encouraged to uh, answer the question uh, through the chat. Wherever there are unanswered questions uh, during the individual presentation will be later addressed in the Q&A sessions. Uh, thereafter, within a few days or a week time, you, the link for the video recorded and also for the webinars will be sent to you so that will be accessed from CIMIT website. The proceeding of the webinar will follow the same pattern as is described on the flyer attached to your invitation email. And with this, actually, let me lead you to the opening session. The official welcome speech will be de delivered by uh, Dr. B. M. Parsana, Director of CGR Research Program MES and Global MES Program of CIMIT. I kindly invite Persana to make an official welcome speech and tell us the webinar organized around quality assurance and quality control. Persana, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, friends, uh, first of all, a very, very warm welcome uh, to all of you for this uh, important webinar on uh, uh, seed systems, which a series of, of webinars we have been organizing under the Accelerated Genetic Gains for Maize and Wheat Improvement uh, Project. In short, it is called the AGG Project, uh, which is being implemented across 13 countries uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this particular aspect of quality assurance, quality control is an extremely important part of our portfolio of work, uh, especially under the seed systems. Uh, for this audience, I don't have to necessarily explain why we need uh, a strong seed systems that meets not only the quantitative requirements, but the quality requirements uh, of the stakeholders. Uh, we do need to produce enough quantities of seed at various points in the seed value chain and meet the diverse demands of the farmers, as well as those companies, seed companies, which are the vehicles for us to meet the requirements of the client communities. And at the same time, uh, CIMIT together with partners, uh, we are doing intensive work on rapid scaling and wider adoption of, of stress tolerant or climate resilient maize varieties. And our most important challenge uh, is how best to replace the old and obsolete varieties with new genetics, with the climate resilient varieties, with better yield and better yield stability. Uh, in the process of this, we should not lose uh, control of the aspect of quality assurance and quality control. Uh, so we have assembled here a very experienced group of panelists uh, from both public and private sector institutions who have been focusing on delivering high quality seed uh, to the farming communities. And uh, we are eager to listen to them. They are not only from CIMIT, there are colleagues from African Seed Trade Association, uh, seed companies in Africa, John McRobert is there. Uh, we have uh, a NARS partner who is at the forefront of meeting the demands of uh, client communities that is Godfrey Asia 
So together with all these partners, uh, uh, we, we intend, and of course, Melu is also there, I forgot to mention. Uh, we intend to meet your requirements and your understanding of this whole issue. Most importantly, uh, seed quality assurance, uh, the methodologies uh, have to embrace newer tools and techniques that provide much greater understanding of genetic purity and genetic identity uh, of uh, inbred lines as well as hybrids uh, that we are uh, developing and disseminating uh, to the seed companies and partners. So QA, QC, uh, not only from the traditional perspective, but also from the molecular perspective is something that we are extremely eager that more and more institutions in sub-Saharan Africa embrace uh, as soon as possible, because that is the only way we can we can be internally and externally uh, be confident that our seed is meeting the highest quality standards. So with that brief remarks, uh, I really look forward to the presentations in this meeting. Uh, for a brief while, I will be leaving the meeting to uh, host uh, another session of the Maze Management Committee, the CRP, but I will be back in half an hour and then I'm eager to listen to colleagues and uh, look forward to a very productive and very intensive engagement of all the participants uh, in this particular webinar. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Parsana, for your nice opening speech and elaborating the need for this webinar. So now I will, uh, I will uh, proceed to the technical presentation. The first presentation of the series is uh, deal with the importance of quality assurance, quality control in seed business, an insight and perspective from Seed Trade Association by Ms. Grace Ghetto. Kindly allow me to introduce Ms. Grace. Grace has over 20 years working experience in seed system at both public and private sectors. She started her career at Carlo as wheat and maize breeder and played a role in release releasing of over seven improved varieties. Then served at CAFIS as senior seed inspector in evaluating varieties for release and protection and other uh, seed regulatory activities. She is currently employed by African Seed Trade Association uh, as a seed expert and guiding on technical aspects and facilitate seed trade in Africa. She has been instrumental in development of regional har Harmonized seed trade regulation in uh, East African community, COMESA, ECOWAS, SADAC, ARIPO, OAPI, and ASFTA. And Grace holds MS degree in agriculture extension and based in horticulture. Dear Grace, with this brief introduction, I kindly invite you to proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Okay. okay. I wish you could magnify it a bit. A bit. That's as big as it will go. Okay, fine. I, I, I'll just, I'll try, I'll try to read, uh, though it is still very small. But uh, that is the background. Uh, I'd given the outline of my presentation. And the first one will be on after background for those who may not know. And AFSTA is an acronym for Africa Seed Trade Association. It is a non-profit <coughs> organization fostering visibility of the Africa seed industry. It was established in 2000 to represent the interest of the private sector in the Africa Agricultural Development Agenda, which we do through promoting trade in quality seeds in Africa, facilitating establishment of national seed trade associations, to represent the Africa agenda, AFSTA agenda at the national level, to advocate for removal, stroke reduction of trade barriers at national, regional, and global level, to develop position papers on pertinent seed issues, to, to present an arguable opinion of the private seed sector, and also to spread activities or spearhead activities that lead to a growth and competitiveness of the Africa seed industry. Those are the key mandates of AFSTA. We have a secretariat that is hosted in Nairobi, Kenya, and a regional office in Dakar. Members of AFSTA are the NSTAs, 
individual seed companies, uh, related public and private institutions. Next. Uh, as far as AFSTA membership, uh, AFSTA has a vision and a mission. And our mission is to promote trade in quality seeds and technologies in Africa for the benefit of members and AFSTA and farmers. We have a vision. And our vision is to be the principal organization at the center of achieving sustainable food security through use of quality seeds for improved livelihood in Africa. AFSTA has focal points in all the high rated countries in, in form of NSTAs or otherwise. And we are looking forward to have everyone, uh, every uh, a focal point in every country in Africa considering that seed trade happens in every country in Africa. Next. Now, I want to give us an overview of seed trade. We all know that when you're talking about seed trade, we are referring to business in producing and marketing seeds. We know that seeds move in countries at the complex global patterns, sorry for purposes of, uh, for many uses, including breeding programs, adaptation, evaluations, and seed production. The desire of seed traders is to produce and deliver seeds to farmers at the right time, uh, right quality, and uh, right costs. The, the estimated global seed market uh, is, was valued at uh, about uh, 66.9 billion by 2018, and it is projected to grow to USD 198.1 by 2024. The Africa seed market value is estimated at, was estimated at 2.08 billion by 2017, and it's expected to, to grow or to reach to 2.79 in 2023. This is a very small share of about 3% of the global market value. So Africa need to do something to change this. The importance of seed trade at the national level is that the national government has, uh, should support the seed trade as it is key to global to the global national no, the GNI and through business taxations the government's benefit it also contributes to employment opportunities and also enhances regional integration and economic growth. Next. Like I stated earlier on, is that uh, seed move at a very complex uh, systems. And this is a demonstration of how seed move. You can see uh, maybe where the seed is produced is not where it is uh, distributed or processed. And also uh, the research centers could be different. So all these are as a demonstration of how seed move uh, at the global level to reach uh, farmers at various points in the continent, in the world. Next. Now, I want the seed associations, uh, what is their role in the seed industry? Now, the seed association, they like call the others, is just a membership group of seed traders who come together to share resources and energy in search of services they desire for themselves and the seed industry stakeholders at national, regional, and global level. That is the main the general uh, definition of the seed associations. Now, the seed associations in Kenya are represented, or their work is to represent and protect the rights and interests of the private seed sector during the seed policy development at national, regional, and global level. And AFSTA has been very key in uh, doing this, and that is the reason we are engaging even here today. Then we have the seed associations at the national level. We refer to them as national seed trade associations, abbreviated as NSTAs. And then we have the regional and global associations, AFSTA representing the Africa uh, continent, APSA represent the Asian continent, ASTA America, Euroseed, uh, the European uh, area. And then we have the ISF, which is the global representative of the seed associations addressing the global uh, aspects of the seed industry. 
At the national level, the NSTAs initiates and maintain dialogue with the country seed policy makers on decisions impacting on the operations of the private seed sector and communicate the same to the members. So the secretariats at the national seed trade associations usually represent the interest of the seed, the, the members at the national dialogues and then share the outcomes to the members. Seed, seed issues beyond the country, regional and global seed issues are handled by regional associations and communicated to the NSTA for further dialogue with the national stakeholders. Next. Now, since you are talking about maize, there is just an overview of what is happening about on maize seed trade in Africa. So we all know that maize is a key staple food crop for many countries in Africa. Some studies were conducted and reviewed that by 2020, uh, there was a 45% increase in the global maize demand. And in the South Sub-Sahara -Sub Africa, the increase was reported at 79%. So this one is very high. So it requires for the, for the seed industry to empower themselves to produce enough seed for, to meet this demand. Now access to high seed, so high quality seed of maize is paramount to increase maize production in a sustainable way. Facilitating the production of high quality maize seeds help to promote competitive seed markets, minimize trade barriers and provide a better choice of varieties for maize farmers. Next. Next, please. Now, for the, as for the topic today, what is the importance of quality assurance and quality control in seed business? Like you have said, uh, seed is a business like all the others and every business must have a quality management system to guide activities for the production of seed quality or quality seeds and meet also the regulatory requirements. Quality assurance and quality control are key components of the quality management systems. And when you are looking at quality assurance, what we are doing is to ensure that all the processes for the production of quality seeds have been fulfilled and this is more about doing the right things. Then when we are looking at quality control, we are looking at the tests and procedures that are undertaken to verify that the quality of seed is achieved. So these are the various, the various uh, tests that each company does to ensure that what they are producing is actually quality seeds. Then what are these quality aspects that we are looking for? One of them is genetic purity. Now we know that production of genetically pure seed is a very heavy investment in seed business. And this has to be maintained so as to realize return on investment and also satisfy farmers' expectations from the seed. Then the other quality is uh, physical quality. And this is done to avoid admixture that contribute to variety deterioration. We don't want the, the genetically pure uh, product to deteriorate fast. We want it to maintain its standards. Then the other quality, the physiological qualities. And this one ensures that the seed capacity to germinate and produce uniform vigorous plant is maintained. Then we have the seed health, and this is to ensure that the seed is free from pests and diseases. I think this one can be elaborated by the regulators. Now, these are the aspects that a seed business has to do. And once you do this, then you, it will be very easy for you to comply to the regulatory authorities, because they are the ones who, uh, who ensure that you are abiding to all this. Next. Sorry, Grace, you have two minutes left. Yes, I'm about to finish. Now, what are the challenges that we have experienced uh, on maintaining the quality assurance and the, and the quality control? One of them is uh, regulatory systems. Uh, we have found that uh, most of uh, uh, the regulators apply outdated laws, which are not uh, meeting the dynamics in the city system. Then you have the regulator capacity. Some of them uh, don't have the relevant skills and that some have very few uh, technical staffs. And also some of the laboratories are not up to date. Then we have the slow implementation of regionally agreed uh, uh, agreements, uh, uh, which are made in various, uh, various uh, organizations as I highlighted there. Then the other challenge is access to breeder seeds. 
We have small and medium seed companies have limited access to breeder seeds. Then you have uh, there are challenges of uh, new breeding technologies and access to those pro products, especially from biotechnology and gene editing. Then we have unclear process of access to public varieties. We know there's a lot of breeding from the public sector, but access to those varieties by, by the seed company, sometimes it becomes a challenge because the, the, the modalities are not clear. Then we have competition from the public uh, seed companies. We know that the public is also doing seed business. So sometimes it becomes a challenge for a private seed company to compete effectively. Then we have uh, seed companies empowerment. That is another challenge. And one of the key challenges here is the lack of awareness of the required uh, regulatory, the regulatory measures. We have trade barriers. There's a lot of tariff and non-tariff barriers. Then we have the management and control of invasive pests and diseases. And in this case, for me, we have the MLN and the FO. And then we have uh, financial and infra infrastructure support, in which case credit facilities are not easy to get. And then we also have the challenge of the national seed trade associations being recognized by the national agricultural agenda. Next. So what after recommendation is that uh, one, the regulatory authority should be, uh, provide a clear quality management systems to enhance compliance by the seed traders. We also recommend that recognition of the seed trade associations be encouraged at the national agricultural agenda. Then we recommend fast tracking of uh, seed agreements at national, regional, and global levels. We look for harmonized and, uh, and uh, implementation of phytosanitary measures that is facilitate seed trade. And then we are also looking for digitization of the, uh, the services that are given to seed traders. And here for we are looking at e phyto e certification, among others. Then we are also looking for licensing of private seed inspectors to complement the activities of the national regulators. Then we have the seed information is lacking, and we encourage that this be put in place to encourage investment in seed business. And then we are also looking for strengthening the seed sector through public private partnerships to en enhance the growth of the Africa seed industry. Next. I think that's the last one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, you are punctual in the presentation and uh, your uh, presentation was insightful and comprehensive. I think you try to address most of uh, the issues we expect, like uh, the role of FTC, uh, African Trade Association, review of seed trade, role of seed association, messy trade, importance of Q uh, and QC uh, in Africa, uh, and also uh, the recommendation. So we thank you for uh, the nice presentation and proceed to the next presentation. The next presentation will be <clears throat> made by Dr. James Getty, uh, Summit Made Seed System Specialist based at Harare, Zimbabwe. Uh, his title of presentation is Quality Characteristics and Available Methods to Test Genetic Purity and Identity. James' main activities in his current position includes providing support for commercialization of cement products through generation of information required for registration of cement germplasm uh, derived products, training, and technical support in East and Southern Africa. He has also been providing NARS and private seed companies start up seed for registration and demonstration of allocated products and provided parent lines for newly and already released hybrids. James, please continue your presentation. Thank you, Adefris. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are, and welcome to the presentation. My name is James Gethy, and uh, this presentation has been made in collaboration with Maje Gauda. I will be uh, presenting on seed quality characteristics and available method to, uh, to test genetic purity and identity. I want to start with uh, the definition of uh, what quality in seed is. And seed quality expresses the extent to which given, a given seed lot meets the standard set for certain attributes, determining the quality of seed that was uh, previously uh, talked briefly by Grace. And it is composed of four main uh, factors. There is a genetic purity, and this is the ability to breed to, to, uh, true to type. We have also physical purity that is uh, uh, analytical. We also have seed health, 
and uh, this includes uh, freedom from diseases. And also there is also the physiological attributes to uh, the seed uh, uh, characteristic. And this includes vigor and viability. And all these factors contribute to what we call quality seed, uh, which means that the seed is genetically and, and physically pure with high germination percentage. And this seed should be at an appropriate percent. Uh, and the seed should be free from diseases and of unwanted seed. I want to start with genetic purity, and this refers to the specific genetic characteristics of the seed, all variety, and it is usually based, uh, measured on uh, morphological based traits, and this includes the field standards, laboratory standards, uh, reaction of a disease to a specific variety, and also morphologically based um, a determination of genetic purity can be done by grow outs. There are also uh, historically but outdated method that uses biochemical methods and also DNA based methods. On uh, physical purity, we are referring to the presence of other seeds and uh, the moisture content of the seed in question. And this usually involves uh, the visual examination of the years, grading, etc. We have the health aspects, uh, which is the absence of diseases. And this involves, for example, field scouting for MLN uh, in the field laboratory screening for viral presence in seed stocks. For example, in, uh, in fields, uh, you can go and scout for diseases that may not be visible with the naked eye. We also have the physiological performance uh, of the seed, and this includes germination, viability, and vigor. And this can be tested uh, through cold tests, accelerated aging, and uh, viability test itself, which can easily be done using the tetrazoleum salt. Uh, the issue of vigor is not uh, clearly uh, understood and tested. Uh, for example, you may have a seed lot A with high vigor, good germination, in a field with an ideal uh, germination, you may get up to about 88%. But in another field, uh, the germination with unfavorable conditions is low. And uh, the same, a different seed lot with low vigor may have a germination percentage of about 90%. In an ideal situation, might be 87 But in an unfavorable condition, uh, it might just be 50% in germination. So the issue of Viga is very important in terms of seed that has to be considered in consideration with the other factors. Of uh, seed quality assurance, therefore, is uh, the process that guarantees that the seed meets high standards, enabling further production of same or different seeds using sound quality management practices that would lead to that high quality seed. As uh, the regulators or the national regulatory agencies are uh, usually are uh, given the responsibility of uh, uh, ensuring that some of these standards are met. For example, in the slide here, I have uh, three different blocks of uh, trading blocks. You have COMESA, SADAC, and EAC. And we have both field standards, laboratory standards, and diseases that have to be monitored in seed production. For example, under the field standards, you are given uh, isolation distances in meters, for example, in production of basic seed, in production of certified seed one, and also the number of off types that must be um, observed that that level is not exceeded the number of inspections that must be done. And also the purity standards are clearly stipulated in the national uh, regulatory agencies in various countries. And also there are common diseases that must be uh, observed and made sure that they don't occur within the various uh, seed lots that are being produced. Uh, but however, this is not true uh, for all uh, countries. They don't have the same standards. If we take the case of SADAC, for example, 
Uh, the field uh, standard, uh, standards are different. And uh, in comparison, if you take, uh, for example, this uh, certified one in Tanzania, the, the levels of standards set by the two countries are different. So you need to be careful when you're doing the, the production of these seed types in different countries. Uh, you can also carry out grow out tests, which are uh, done by planting of inbred lines or the varieties that you want to test. For comparison against a uh, check of known test of uh, using morphological characteristics. The slide are the pictures to written A, B, and C were grow out evaluations of lines planted in Kiboko. And as you can see, line A and B uh, came from different sources, but A and B seem to be uh, true to type compared to line C, which is uh, different. Therefore, with grow outs, you can easily identify the lines that are uh, not conforming to type and then remedial action taken to either throw this line away or to purify it. Uh, the biochemical assay, are out, I'm putting this slide to show that they existed, but they are not uh, used uh, these days by, by many of uh, the partners that you're working with. Now, what brings in, uh, what are the challenges in quality seed production, for example? We have challenges in parental lines, which, uh, which can uh, get genetically impure or they're not homogeneous. There is also the issue of genetic identity among different seeds, uh, seed sources, for example, growers and uh, batches. And also in terms of hybrids, genetic uniformity across, across uh, contract growers versus seed batches. Uh, can bring uh, challenges in terms of quality that, of the seed that is produced. And then you need to also identify the, the parent offspring relationships by conducting parent uh, parentage uh, verification within the seed lots that you, you're dealing with. Where does this uh, impurity come from? For, uh, for uh, genetic impurity issues can result from residual heterozygosity uh heterozygosity you can also get pollen contamination from uh, uh seed multiplication due to short isolation distances they are all due to seed mating especially if they're off types within your field then uh, there is also the seed admixture during harvesting shelling and packing and also from uh, the previous crops you may get some volunteers crops that may be contributing to, uh, to the impurity of the lines that you're working with. This is a slide I put in to show uh, what you're, we are doing at CEMET. We routinely check the purity of our lines and uh, check the, the level at which this material is contaminated. And uh, we group them in nurseries and check how well our plants are in terms of uh, in pure lines, pure lines, in pure lines, and the lines that do not conform, like the ones that are highlighted in red, are rejected, and the ones that are highlighted in yellow are usually um, are usually uh, reselected for purity purposes. Uh, in our nineteen, uh, in your twenty nineteen evaluations. 79.4% of our inventory were found to be a pure. Uh, so we need to work very hard to ensure that we conform to the laid down standards for the seed that we share with our partners. This, uh, the sources of uh, genetic um, impurity can lead to materials being confused. So we can also use uh, our different systems to, uh, to carry out genetic identity uh, and we do uh, carry out uh, genetic identity of lines that you're working with. So where do these genetic identity issues arise from? One is from the labeling er errors which uh, may result from planting the wrong parents. We may also have pla be planting the wrong parents, delayed tussling, 
which results in uh, selfed seeds other than the hybrids that we intend to produce. But how can we uh, use our molecular markers to identify the lines that are uh, not, not pure? Uh, this is work that was done by a team at CIMIT that they looked at several sources of lines uh, within our breeding hubs and they were able to identify the lines that uh, were pure and some of the lines that were not uh, pure were identified, especially where the dis genetic distances were too far away. So the genetic or identity of the materials can be a challenge in a seed production, trade and dispute uh, resolutions, and th the sources of the materials can also play an important line in that line identity. Work done by Chen et al. also showed that uh, you can use SNP markers to identify the materials that you're working with. And as long as you have a sizable number of markers, you will be able to identify the materials that you're working with without problems. Uh, for genetic identity using a SNPs. Sorry. James, you are left with two minutes. Yes, uh, we have materials at, uh, we can identify lines based on uh, uh, the, uh, the, the SNPs that are available in the materials, like uh, last shown by the work done by Manje uh, in 2018. And this uh, technique can also be used to identify hybrids uh, from the uh, crosses between parents and uh, non-parents. And we can also identify uh, whether the F1 that is being indicated in that slide is uh, the, the identity of those lines that are being shown, uh, the, the material is either a hybrid or not a hybrid. There is also a seed production technology that is using uh, a gene that is called MS that is uh, going to be used in production of hybrids for detasseling. So what you're saying is quality seeds are obtained through a deliberate process that allows a laid down procedures to ensure conformity to laid down standards. And there are several ways that you can do that range all the way from physical, morphological, and biochemical methods, but DNA, DNA markers can be used to verify, purify, and identify uh, specific parents, lines, and products. And although markers are not being used uh, currently for certification, this is an area that we can go and uh, get uh, better seeds to our farmers. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Uh, as usual, a very clean and clear presentation and a very comprehensive one. I don't want to pretend um, to summarize this presentation, rather pass to the next presentation. Yeah, it's a very good presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, the next presentation is going to be made by, is going to be given by Dr. Manje Gouda. Manje is a molecular breeder based at Simit, Kenya. As you know, genomics and molecular techniques are vital along the seed value chains. Accordingly, Manje is playing important role in mass seed quality assurance and quality control, including but not limited to uh, implementing marker-based quality control for CIMIT African-based program, as you saw it from uh, James' presentation, and also coordinate with NARS, National Agriculture Research System, and uh, small and medium enterprise partners to Im implement quality control in their breeding program to ensure high-quality commercial seed production, commercial seed production. With this brief Introduction, uh, I will uh, invite Dr. Manje to continue his presentation. Uh, Manje, the microphone is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, in this presentation, I'm mainly focused on more of technical aspect on what molecular markers we are using and how we are using for uh, QC purpose. So to start with broadly, markers in a breeding program applied for five different purposes, depending on their importance. Here we can see the grouping also. 
we can use the markers for discovery and validation if i start with the lowest one then uh, to know the to identify the new markers to be associated with a phenotypic trait followed by genomic selection which is mainly used for improving the quantitative traits and marker assisted selection which is mainly for selecting a trait which is governed by major genes or major QTLs and the fingerprint means it's to have a reference map with a mid density or high density so we use the molecular markers and finally but which is very simple but it is very crucial in the commercial seed production quality control we use the markers mainly for to genetic purity genetic identity as well as uh, parentage identification so qc is the most simplest and important marker application why especially in maize because it's a cross pollinated crops there is more possibility that there is a possibility to or we need to check each and every step always whether it maintain the its original status or not there is always possibility of inadvertent selfing or seed mixtures which is during especially in the harvesting time and also packaging errors possibly labeling errors so these are many reasons which I already explained by uh, uh, james and the earlier presentation the main importance is the cost of the this method is so low, but return is on investment is so high. How we will see in the next following slides. So yeah. broadly, we use markers, the, uh, this marker based QC for four different purposes, genetic purity and identity in a inbred lines and parent offspring identity, as well as genetic purity of hybrid seed lots. So if you look into the uh, maize breeding uh, whole the product development. So where we apply the, the QC here, you can see four or five different stages where QC is play a crucial role. So we need to apply, uh, we need to check the QC at these stages, starting with the F1 nursery to make sure that the F1 nursery is true to type for the selected parental lines. And followed by once the finished lines are read, finished parental lines. This is in the part of the product development, mainly within the breeding program. So where QC plays an important role to make sure that the particular lines are genetically pure and genetically identic identity, genetically identical, sorry, genetic identity. So then it starts product commercialization where the importance of QC will be even higher in the breeder seed and in basic foundation seed, basic seed or foundation seed. So we have to check regularly about the QC, whether they are genetically pure or not. And if it is a hybrids, are there, the parentage verification is very crucial to make sure that we have a high quality products are coming out. So if you want to choose the molecular markers, what criteria we should consider? It's in a very simple way. We're not going to detail. The marker should be a polymorphic. That means that alleles more. Sorry, please. It's a polymorphic means it represents more than one allele in our population. So it's not a monomorphic marker. So near even allele frequency. Why? Because whenever if the one allele is a very rare, there is a possibility that we're missing and we may not use the purpose what we intend to use and robust performance with possibility of multiplexing that means if the marker is robust so it's easy to scale up so we can use it for large numbers in a quick time so minimum number means cost is very crucial lower the cost then we can do this for many time and it should and these markers whatever we choose for qc set it should represent the entire genome and it's can give an option to choose an optimal set which can use is enough to discriminate the genetic materials in question. So based on these criteria, there are two studies which are published from CIMIT. These are the two studies, one on quality control, specifically focused on Africa elite lines, and one other, another one study, which is by Chen et al, which is on CML lines. So these two studies are useful to, to develop a QC set. 
So after the, based on these two studies, you can see the set of 100 line, uh, sorry, 100 markers were developed. These 100 markers are distributed throughout the 10 chromosomes. These are having kind of high polymorphic information content. They are distributed across genome. They're representing well. So these set we recommended as this is the be relatively best QC set to be used for QC results. And all the information regarding these markers, as well as how it was selected all and how it can be used is all in detail is given in a technical manual, the QC assurance, the QC technical manual, which is available for all. In addition, there is one more QC set has been developed. It's called rapid QC set. This can we can use if we have prior knowledge of the our material. That means we have done QC many times earlier. So just we want to know quick. So this is another set uh, QC markers, we can use it. This is again well represented for all 10 chromosomes. So what is the threshold scenario to consider that this is genetically pure or not? If it is, that is the threshold, why we use that threshold? Generally, if we have, if our breeding program is uh, based on that uh, traditional, uh, like a pedigree based method, if we are choosing the final line at F6 stages, we expect there will be at least 3% of uh, residual heterozygosity remain there. In addition, there is some little bit genetic drift and also possible errors due to genotyping. Together, it costs at least four to 5% heterozygosity is still remaining. In that case, we can't expect like uh, select the line which is having 100% pure. So that's why in, to select the genetic purity, the standard is 95% if the line is developed through traditional uh, uh, pedigree breeding method. If it is line developed through DH line, the threshold is 99%. That means only 1% of heterozygosity is allowed. Yeah, this is uh, the, if you want to consider any line as a pure, that line should have a heterozygosity of less than 5%. If it is line derived from a DH, the, you can expect less than 1% of heterozygosity. We at least 99% it should be pure. In case, if we get a line with a 5 to 15% heterozygosity, what we should do? Can we throw or not? No, we no need to throw. So we have to go one more, one more season of year to row selection. Then the next season, we can do the uh, QC again to make sure that this heterozygosity level to reduce less than 5%. If we find more than 15% heterozygosity, that is more uh, worrisome. Either we have to discard that, or if it is very crucial, we have to follow, follow some more uh, cleaning of that, but, uh, that lines. In addition, for genetic identity, we also use like more than two, more than one, two sources to make sure that those are genetical identical. For that genetic identity, we use either reference reference marker or we use the genetic distance. What is the reference marker or reference profile means? If particular line is very important for the, for the company or for the, it's the final product, we need to have a, its a markers profile earlier available. We call it as a reference profile. So coming to, if you want to know genetic purity, we have a marker data, how we should, uh, uh, tell that this is genetically pure or not. This is a simple illustration of a parental line one. If we have a three sources, here you can see out of 10 markers, how many are homozygous, how many are heterozygous. This shows that the source B, which is 100% heterozygous, we have to accept it, but others which is having more heterozygous loci has to be rejected. So this is a simple way to select either it is a uh, accepting the threshold of genetic purity or not. Similarly, for the to genetic identity, many times the line is genetically pure, but it is not genetically identical. To avoid that confusion, we need to have an original source, which is already genotyped, which is called a reference profile. And we have to compare that particular profile with the line in the question. It should match more than 99% same uh, profile, then only it's considered as genetically identical. 
so that we can do it if we have a small numbers we can do it in excel sheet but if you want to if you have it too many uh, lines in question so this is the best way to use a flapjack where we can have a visualization of our uh, material how it they look like and that can be used for selection when it comes to single cross hybrid the question is like whether single cross hybrid is true to type for the parents whether both the parents are equally contributed to develop my single cross hybrids this is one simple example if the parent one is having a allele of cc if a parent two has aa the expectation is ac if it is not that is not the case that means alleles are not sharing between two parents so when we have the QC set out of 100 markers, at least more than at least 95 markers should share the uh, markers from both the parents. Then it is considered as the hybrid parentage verification is true. Otherwise, there is a possibility that foreign pollen or something happened, which is not too pure. So single cross hybrid is quite a bit straightforward, but when it comes to three way cross hybrid, it's more complicated because of a three parents. So first stage here, we have three different stages. Well, first stage, make sure that all three parents are genetically pure homozygous. The second stage is if parent one and parent two are contributing more than 95% for the single cross hybrid or not. If single cross hybrid is good, or it means more than 95% of alleles are shared between parent one and parent two, that is okay. Your single cross hybrid is, is true to type, you can use it. The next question is how I can identify my three way cross hybrid is true to type or not. So, in that case, among the QC set, you need to identify markers which are monomorphic between parent one and parent two. So that single cross hybrid, it stays as homozygous. Then you compare same markers with the parent three, they should be polymorphic. Then the last question, last thing to finalize it, this kind of markers, how many are sharing the alleles for your three way cross hybrid? So, in that way, it has to follow at least more than 95% of the selected markers should share the alleles from single cross and parent three. Then we can say that our three-way cross hybrid is derived from the selected parentage only. It's clearly representing all three parents. So those are the true to type to be considered or to be selected. In addition to QC set, you see, yes, you are left with one minute. Please wrap up your presentation. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, in addition to QC, we'll have, we can combine with some trade specific markers as well with the same cost. Here, we're an example for uh, mesh streak virus and also for pro, uh, PVA markers. So we can use. So sampling, yeah, sampling is same as we do for traditional. Uh, grow test and others yeah for the uh, to use the markers for the qc we no need to have our own lab it's very simple it's easy to do uh, outsourcing so we no need to have specialized by people so either we can use the seed or we can use the leaf for dna extraction we can send it there will be several service providers who can give us quickly the results so the sampling, either we can go for single plant-based sampling or we can go for bulking up four to five plants of same entry to reduce the cost. So this is the cost for two service providers can be used. Either you can go for 10 markers or up to 100 markers. So the cost will be around $500 per, per sample. So EIB and the CIMIT, how we are work, helping or how we are working with the partners is mainly we are organizing some of the QC uh, training programs, mainly focusing on partners and regulators, and also providing technical support. Currently, EIB is also covering genotyping cost for NAS partners for QC. So in conclusion, establishing proper QC with the 
is a fundamental requirement, especially for seed companies, uh, and also it's for private private uh, breeding program as well. So we have a set of around 50 to 100 SNPs, which is a QC set available. And also its information is also available in a, our technical manual, which can be, which is useful for any partners to be used. And we also help uh, helping, we are ready to help for uh, all partners by providing our technical support. And it is possible also to define, you know, if we have 100 marker, we don't need to select all 100 markers we can have an optimal number of markers depending on what is our main objective. So in that way, we can, we can even reduce the cost of testing further, less than $5 also. Thank you. Thank you, Manje. Uh, you took one or two minutes uh, more than the time assigned to you. But thank you very much for the nice detailed presentation. I think it uh, has so much technical issue and uh, uh, we will be sharing the presentation to our uh, audience later uh, so that uh, they will get acquainted with this technique. And uh, I think uh, it is very exhaustive presentation that includes application of molecular qu markers in quality control, the different stages where we can make uh, uh, qual quality control in the breeding pipeline, uh, characteristics of a molecular marker, a uh, good molecular marker for quality control, the SIMIT experience in developing the marker sets, the markers based quality control set, uh, and uh, so many other things like setting the threshold scenarios and uh, including the price and uh, everything. So it's a very nice presentation and thank you very much for that. With this, I will uh, proceed to the next presentation. The next presentation is a sort of a continuation of uh, Dr. Manje's talk. Uh, by Godfrey as here. Uh, Godfrey will stand uh, today in front of us to share his nurse experience on the application of molecular markers in seed quality assurance and quality control on behalf of Eastern Africa NARS, uh, on behalf of the Eastern Africa uh, region. Do Dr. Godfrey is one of CIMIT's closer collaborator in East Africa and serves as director of research and Mess Breeder uh, in the National Crop Research Research Institute, uh, which is a constituent of the Uganda National Agriculture Research Organization, popularly known as NARO. And he has been a lead mess breeder for more than 15 years and has released, registered, released and or registered more than 20 mess varieties that are commercially produced. And uh, Dr. Godfrey uh, has also contributed in providing technical support for small and medium enterprise and strengthening seed system in Uganda. Dr. Asia holds a PhD in agriculture, plant breeding and genetics from Ohio State University and MSc in crop science from Makarari University. Uh, Godfrey, uh, this is your turn. Please go ahead with the presentation. Thank you, Adefres, for the kind introduction. Greetings to everybody in this meeting. And also allow me to thank uh, all the previous presenters for excellent background that will make our life quite easy in the next presentations. So allow me also to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to share our experience in the uh, uh, molecular based uh, QCQA application in seed quality, but also product development. And you'll see in my presentation, I have uh, expanded the scope of the QA, CQ, Q, QA, QC application for both product development, but also seed quality control, uh, uh, but also uh, included examples from a few crops. Uh, but later on, I'll focus and remain on maize until we go to seed quality issues. Uh, so, so my presentation will focus on the QCQA in product development, uh, particularly on F1 verification and parental purity, but also importantly on the forward breeding and the marker system process. Uh, I'll also 
dwell on uh, QCQ and the seed quality, uh, but most importantly, what have we been able to do the information in terms of improving seed quality uh, uh, here in Uganda? So in terms of product development, we have been uh, using markers in a number of crop commodities and, uh, and use it for forward breeding applications, especially for some of the key traits, uh, selecting favorable alleles. Uh, number two, also for backgrounds, backgrounds intro, uh, intro, introgressions, particularly for trace data deficit in our germplasm. Uh, F1 verifications, so that uh, we really advance what is verified. Otherwise, you'll be fooling yourself and wasting resources and time. And uh, also purity in terms of core or founder lines, so that we can make informative decisions and also crosses. So allow me to start with the rice. I told you a few crops. I think rice is one of the crops with the, a lot of genetic resources, particularly in the HTPT platform for forward breeding. You can see a number of uh, QTLs and the number of markers spanning all the chromosomes that are deposited in HTPT and which is useful for application forward breeding and we have been able to use this uh, starting two three years ago and they uh, continue to do that and um, what this saw is distribution of some of our f3 populations we sent the last year for genotyping uh, uh, which have a number of the key traits that we need i'll come to this a bit later but i think what is important is uh, we have been able to use uh, qqc for f1 verification we have sent and did not type the over 600 F1s and use that information for advancement, uh, culture, and also some other decisions. But on the right table also, we've been able to use it in four breeding with a number of crosses, uh, populations for some of the key traits for advancement. Uh, as you see in this graph, as I showed earlier, uh, for some of the key traits, particularly consumer preferred traits for fragrance gene, but also some key stresses. Uh, this is a, a rice blast, BLB bacterial blight, and then also rice elemental virus, which are some of the key stresses in rice. So you can see the distribution of our germplasm in terms of uh, some of the favorable alleles. So this is another way to look at it. Uh, so using some of the marker panels, we're able to uh, select some of the key favorable uh, traits for advancement in the F3 population. So you can see color code, the green are those with the alleles present. So the red will be those uh, without the alleles. Uh, so this is going for over 300 germplasm. And a similar case for granites, we have been able to genotype over 380 elite germplasm for key for three key traits, uh, which is the uh, leaf spot, rust, and the high oleolic, which are key consumer preferred traits in granites, and they be able to select and combine multiple trait preferences in some of the background germplasm that you can use. Uh, by color code here again, you can discard the reds or select single for traits or combine for the traits. So that's how I've been able to use that information. That now brings me to, to maize, our efforts in maize. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of work um, starting last year on F1 verification. We have genotyped 360 F1s from 36 crosses with 50 marker panel, QCQ, QAQC mocha panel for white maize, over 366 elite lines, uh, pro vitamin A, about 94 lines, and the DH line, 754. And uh, uh, we, we used the 44 ketal marker, markers for profiling and 50 QACQ, uh, QAQC markers. Uh, the other work I've also been able to do is uh, use the marker for 
backcross back, back introgression of MLM and MICV uh, in, the, in the panel. Uh, in the 376 entries that were genotyped uh, recently. So what you see here is, uh, if I can start with the, uh, the bug cross population that was genotyped for MLM and MSV, of course, you can see the greens are, are favorable alleles for the key traits. So we picked a number of uh, lines with favorable alleles for MLM and also pick the number of lines for favorable alleles with MSV. But also you can do combined selection where you can see where there's green selected to the right is where there's alleles for both uh, MSV and MLN. And that's what we're looking for. And we continue to do this for all the populations uh, for, for the background uh, MLN donor we used in our advancement. So in terms of F1 verification, uh, this is just one cross, uh, a, a number of markers. You can see uh, that uh, most of these markers were polymorphic in all the loci. And uh, so the F1 was uh, heterozygous, 50% heterozygous, and that is expected good quality for F1 verification to move forward. And that is the information we're using to advance some of this population to move forward. Uh, now from here, we'll go to our effort on uh, using QAQC in uh, parental seed quality improvement. We started this work up to about 2014, 2015, up to, 20, up to current. And uh, that time we piloted uh, with eight seed companies and sampled about 85. Uh, we sampled 85 parental lines and genotyped them with uh, 144 markers in LCG platform. And uh, our analysis showed that uh, using the QAQC standards where uh, for less than 5% heterozygous is accepted in inbred line, 53, 62% of the lines passed the test for quality while 16, which represented 19% of the 85 lines uh, were highly heterozygous with between six to 10% heterozygosity. And then also about 15, which is 18% were very highly heterozygous with the greater than 20% heterozygosity. So the actions we took here for, for these lots, which were bad was we were able to work with the respective seed companies to replace the stocks with the new breeder seed stocks, but also did some trainings for the production on, on maintenance of these lines uh, and, 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 and replacing them. So that's the work we're able to do there. So graphically, you can see the representation to the, uh, to the right uh, bottom line there, uh, the distribution in terms of parental line purity, uh, uh, quite a number were we passed the test and were very pure. And also in terms of heat map or distance matrix, you can see a number of them lines were lining up very well. Uh, that, were, that were pure. 2017, 2018, we continued with this effort and also uh, using the eight pilot seed companies which commanded the biggest market sale. We sampled 79 lines. And in this analysis, you can see 44 lines passed the test of five, less than 5% of the heterozygosity, which was representing 56%. And 11 of the lines were between 6 to 20% heterozygosity. And this was, uh, which was bad. So we had to also work with the companies to replace those stocks and also conducted trainings to them. But also there was a high number that was very highly heterozygous close to 30%. So similarly, we also replaced that stock and worked with the companies to train the, the production officers. Again, you can see the representation in terms of purity distribution, still a significant number was pure, and, but there were still these uh, pure lines that could contaminate the hybrids. So again, using the standards for QCQA, 
uh, any line with greater than 5% matter distance, the metric distance is considered impure. So you can see a number of these lines uh, uh, were impure and they also discarded them and they replaced them with the companies. So that effort could is continuing and we're using it, we are using it to improve quality. So we also did it with the single cross in 2017, 2018. And the single cross test is really a parent of spring test. And it is to build confidence real of seed growers uh, in terms of the quality of the, either the single cross, but also the three way, as you saw in Monday's presentation. And uh, to assure that indeed the three way cross is coming from the original parental lines, uh, which, were, uh, which were pure. So again, using the color codes, color codes, we're able to, within confidence of limit, so what is acceptable to move forward. Of course, for a single cross, you expect 50% heterozygosity coming from the two parents. We use 96 markers. Uh, so you can see the greens are where we think we are very close to 50% heterozygosity and we allowed it to proceed forward. But anything less than that, we color code a bit orange or red, and so replaced that with the new uh, new foundation uh, foundation seed or single So I picked Good. here. I Good. picked here one example. Yes. Of the yes, yes. One single cross. You can see same single cross, but. He, Earlier it was green, but the following year, of course, I think it got contaminated. You can see the trosagosti reduced drastically. So we did not allow that and work with the company to replace it. So that's an example of how we're using the QCQA markers for quality improvement. And uh, that work continues. So using that that's information, what have we been able to do? Number one, as I mentioned, we were able to uh, we're able to do a lot of stock replacements on parental lines with the companies that had problems. But the important thing also ramped up our uh, EGS production so that uh, we can be able to supply quality seeds to the companies. We have been able to continue annual trainings for on seed every year since 2013, and that has been helpful. But also follow that up with the field visit to each company at least we try to make at least two season, two visits per season to each seed company and discuss with them and see whether the production and maintenance are still okay. So that effort has been going on and we plan to continue with it. So moving forward, this brings me to my last slide. I think uh, we see this is an important tool in both product development, but also seed quality improvement. In the product development, we will continue with this effort of genotyping for QAQC to, to profile, particularly the founder lines before we make crosses, but most importantly, integrate QAQC uh, for F1 verification for all pedigree starts, but also before we send materials for DH. Uh, plan to implement marker assisted breeding for key traits where markers are available. Of course, for maize now, currently, there's a limitation because there's just about 40 markers with STPG and a few key traits. Hopefully that will increase with the time. And uh, of those also, those with utility are less than 40. So planting continue with that effort. But of course, I've also started implementing markers for genomic selection for rapid recycling for some of the key traits. And we think that's an effort to so continue with moving forward. On the CD side, I think that effort of mainstreaming QC, Q, uh, QA, QC, in the maintenance and quality improvement uh, will continue with the companies, but also internally here uh, in the maintenance of the lines. So that effort will continue, but the most important, how to mainstream it in the company's uh, quality management systems. Number two, also increase our effort in all the recent seed production, particularly breeder seed, and also continue to do year draw, particularly to identify those that have problems uh, or need purification. But we also see another important utility for this in variety monitoring, especially if you can get customized markers for some of the key lines, but also some of the key hybrids. Uh, what also this means is we shall need to build capacity of the companies in the QA, QC applications and also use. And uh, as narrow, we started the business arm about two years ago, 
And one of the things in the business arm in the narrow holding is EG scaling. And I think that will play an important role and key role to be able to support the seed companies move forward. One of the key lessons I think from this is uh, operationally, we see need for operation framework to guide coordination, handoff, but also decisions uh, using this technology. But the most important also traceability because there's a lot of information from both the genotyping, but also the field selections on how to move forward. So operational framework will be very, very important to guide this and use this to move forward. So with that, I thank you very much and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Godfrey, uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, I appreciate the effort being carried out in uh, uh, Uganda. Uh, actually, you are doing uh, in a number of crops and uh, different genomic workers, including the quality control. And uh, it's a very good one to learn, actually, even the action, what you are doing after identifying uh, the results. Uh, uh, similar to the other, I don't pretend to summarize your presentation. It was very nice and uh, really uh, it seems that NARO is moving ahead uh, on this regard. Thank you again and we'll proceed to the next presentation. The next presentation will be made by Dr. Uh, Meluliki uh, Zikaya, Zikali, uh, sorry. Uh, he's a molecular scientist at CIDCO uh, Zimbabwe, and he will be narrating on the same topic to that of Godfrey, but with different that, uh, like telling us molecular marker-based quality control from the privacy company perspective. We already heard uh, from the public, uh, from the NARS, uh, uh, from Godfrey. The big private companies uh, widely exploited genomic and molecular techniques for product development and producing and marketing high quality seed. Uh, Dr. Mole Melu uh, is passionate in molecular breeding, gene cloning, marker design, GTL mapping, and bioinformatics, and indeed in agronomy. He received his PhD uh, in molecular genetics from John In uh, Centers, University of East Anglia. His MSc. Uh, in plant genetics and crop improvement from England and uh, his Bachelor of Science Applied Biology and Biochemistry from National University of Science and Technology, Zimbabwe. Dr. Zakali has many discoveries during his graduate and postgraduate studies and received different awards for his outstanding performance. Now uh, we are ready to hear uh, the presentation from Dr. Mululeki. Uh, Dr. Muliki, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can all see my screen now. Yeah, it is visible, very much visible. Thank you very much. So I will get on to it so that I don't uh, eat into the 10 minutes, that into the 15 minutes that I've got. Um, yep, I saw that this has been done. So these are the reasons why we do uh, uh, why we need molecular, why we need the uh, uh, quality assurance in maize breeding is because you want to make sure that when you are developing a hybrid, it is the hybrid that you are selling and not anything else. Otherwise, if you don't do proper quality assurance, you might end up selling your inbreds, which look sorry looking as you can see there compared to hybrids, and then this will affect a lot of other things downstream. I also realized that uh, traditionally we were using morphological markers. That is, you can use your size of your seeds or even the shape. And when you do your grow out, which I'm going to refer to as quote here, uh, it's morphological testing you're using your eyes using non morphological characteristics. And this is good and it's still being used in conjunction with uh, molecular tools. But today I'll concentrate on the uh, markers because of these limitations that we have when we are using uh, these morphological markers. The problem is that with your morphological markers, sometimes it takes you a lot of time, it is laborious, and uh, sometimes the environment might work against you, and sometimes it can be subjective as well. I always say genes don't lie. Uh, it's people who lie, but genes never lie. So that's why I'm going to spend a lot of time focusing on molecular markers uh, in, in breeding or in, in maize seed production. 
So if you see the picture that I put on the right, I think you can see the red arrow there pointing on a self to plant compared to the big circle there that you can see uh, where we have uh, where we have uh, that hybrid which is nice and good looking compared to that sorry looking inbred line which is down there. So if you do not uh, do quality assurance downstream, you might have serious problems. Sometimes you might not recover from some of the mishaps that might happen there. Moving on to the real uh, presentation now. Uh, uh, molecular markers, there are many of them. I'm happy most of them have been mentioned now, but it's not limited to those that I've listed down. So basically most of them, most of these markers require uh, uh, involve you targeting certain portions or unique portions in the DNA. Uh, the isos are, they are proteins, but the rest of them there are DNA-based markers, and you use uh, different methods for SSR. There is your single, uh, simple sequence repeats, your RFLP, your restriction fragment length polymorphism is uh, demonstrated by that gel that you see on the on the on, on the rightmost side there. That's a restriction fragment, a length polymorphism kind of a gel that you see where you can distinguish based on sizes. And then your rapids, your randomly amplified polymorphic DNAs, and then your clip amplified polymorphic sequences and your CASP. I'm going to concentrate on CASP because CASP is what uh, we use uh, at CEDCO. And I think it's the method of choice in, in most the elite labs across the world. And then just to just to show you there. So for your simple sequence repeats, you are just looking at the different sizes that you have. So like the topmost one there, down the arrow there. I don't know whether you can see my my mouse arrow there. Is my mouse arrow visible? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I'm saying that topmost one there. It's longer by just one repeat. And then the second one there, it's it's shorter by one repeat, and then the bottommost one is shorter by two repeats compared to the first one. And then when you are using SSRs, it tracks that, and it's very easy for you to see that. And it, it's a method that is still being used uh, in a lot of labs across the world. Then just to show the reason why I think CASP has uh, taken over as the method of choice, when you look at those pictures for isozymes, you can look and see that sometimes it's not very easy to distinguish between your bands there. Some of them might be thin, might be faint, not because the reaction did not work very, very well. That is the top left there, the isozymes. And then when you look at your rapids as well, sometimes it can be cluttered, sometimes it can be very difficult for you to notice. But when you look on the cusp section now, on the left side, those red, green, and blue dots, it's very easy to tell which one is which one compared to the other methods, and it's also high throughput. That's why it's a method of choice in uh, most labs across the world. Right, so uh, for those who might want to, to see the kind of lab that uh, we have, it's a SNP line kind of a lab, the LGC based SNP line kind of a lab. And I'm showing you the, the both sides of the coin. So we just have a dual a SNP line there, as you can see, and it has got uh, these kinds of equipment that I'm, I'm showing you now. So that's the process overall of doing a, of using the CASP genotyping platform. You need a genome grinder, the first one there. Of course, you need uh, some incubators and some uh, centrifuges for your DNA extraction there and some fridges that I've not put there. You also need your liquid dispensing uh, tools as well. Your fluid X on the top left there, and then your meridian on the bottom top right and meridian on the bottom right. Those are your fluid dispensing uh, uh, instruments. And then you also have your cube for sealing the place because it uses the hydrocycler. So your PCR is immersed inside water. So this is the latest version of the hydrocycler. I wish I'd put the older version of the hydrocycler there. So that's basically your SNP line. And then this is basically how it goes, maybe very shortly there, so that we can all have a look. So you start off from your material, which can either be seed or leaf. You can tailor it to do anything else. You need your genome grinder there. So the genome grinder crushes your leaf or seeds. And then you need to go through a DNA extraction process, which passes through centrifugation. You also need to quantify your DNA using that nano dropover there. Then your liquid dispensing systems, 
that I was talking about in between, you need to incubate when you're extracting your DNA. Then when you're putting into your final place for analysis, you need your meridian and also your plate sealers there. Then you need your hydrocycler, that's the older version of the hydrocycler. And then you also need a platform to test your, to see your results, which is called the Ferraster that I'm showing over there. So if you do everything very, very well, you should be able to succeed and score a goal. And the goal in this case looks like that. So you've got that screen that has got three colored dots, the red ones, the green ones, and the blue ones. I'll talk a little bit about them as we go. Right, so just to give an overview of the competitive analyst specific PCR, it just basically uses two forward primers, which are linked to fluorescent tails. The other one, fluoresces is red, the other one, fluoresces is blue. So if you have homozygous uh, linked to your red fluorescence, everything becomes red. You see the red dots on the top uh, left corner. I'll show you another other, other diagrams down there. Then if your thing is homozygous also, but homozygous carrying the allele with the A, they're labeled in blue, everything fluoresces blue, and you're going to have a picture like that. So if you've got your homozygous red, it comes on the top right. It sits neatly over there. And if it's homozygous A, as you can see, it will be blue on the bottom right corner there. If you are going to have a heterozygous, a heterozygote of both of them, you know when you mix red color and blue color, you get your green. So your heterozygotes always sit in the middle there. So CASP system is very, very easy to use and it's very much uh, scalable. The system that we are using now uses 384 uh, uh, 384 blocks and it runs about uh, 16 of them at a time. So you are looking at more than 5,000 data points that you can do. And then uh, we, you can also use the 1536 one, which even does a, a, a more throughput. Right, then when it comes to, to using these SNP markers in, in quality assurance in maize, I'm going to use the example that I'm showing you over there. So basically, when you are doing your work, you, you, it, it comes in the 384 wall plate system that we use. This. It separates our plates. It takes four 96 wall plates. So what you are seeing down there the, uh, on that picture on the left where my mouse is, that's a representative of your 96 wall plate. And then inside your 96 wall plate, each well is unique. So each reaction happens in the end. These are very, very small reactions because you can do a reaction of less than two microliters. So two microliter reaction in each and every one of those wells. And then depending on which allele it's going to be carried, if it's linked to a blue fluorescent tail, it fluoresces blue. If it's linked to something that is heterozygous, it's going to show you those green ones. And in this case, I'm saying the one that is written in red A there, we already know prior that on this particular marker, everything is supposed to be blue. So anything else that is not blue, is coming from somewhere else. In this case, if it's going to be green, we know that your inbred line was pollinated by something from outside, giving you those green uh, uh, dots over there. So the system that you can use in, our, in, 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 in the case of this lab that we have, we, first of all, we had a chip of 20,000 uh, cusp SNPs. And then from that 20,000 SNPs, uh, 18 markers were selected which are diagnostic of all the materials that we have. So for your genetic purity testing, you can select those 18 markers. Actually, by using 18 markers, we go beyond genetic purity testing. We actually go on to, 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 to be very sure that this is a particular hybrid that we have. But even with as little as six markers, six to 12 markers, you can be able to do your genetic purity testing very, very well. So starting from a large pool, I'm happy that some presenters have already touched on this in the previous presentations. You can start from a, from a pool of your material and then you test it yeah, using a lot of markers that should of course cover the whole genome. And then from there you can select a subset now that you use for purity testing, that you use for other uh, processes. If you need to identify a line, maybe in cases of disputes, you can go back to that big a data set that you have got and genotype to an extent that there will be a, a, a scientific proof that we have really identified that this is your line. So in short for this one, because I've said a lot, you can have as many as a, a, a small subset of markers that give you like a profile for every inbred line, for every hybrid that you've got. 
And then once you state your, you test your original materials and you've got those genetic profiles, then anything else in future can be tested against that. Right, right, I'll give you another example here. So I'm saying if you cross inbred line A with inbred line B, you get your heterozygous hybrid X. It should look as nice as that over there. But then if you, if you have a problem that there is selfing, maybe as you are uh, uh, making your hybrids, some of them self, and then they give you that scenario, scenario that I've shown you before yourselves, of course, they don't get bigger as your hybrids. You can easily track and see that using these uh, SNP markers. For instance, in this case, you know that your hybrid, yes, for this particular marker, this is just one marker that, uh, that you are looking at here. So your inbred A crossed with your inbred B, everything else should be green because inbred A is fluorescing blue and inbred B is fluorescing red. When you mix the two, you should get everything else green. So anything else that is not green is your contamination. But in this case, because we know that our inbred A was blue, those blue dots that we see over there, we are very sure that it's the blue that is coming from the selfing of your female. So you can easily do that for single crosses. This process is also good for, for, three, for two way crosses uh, as, as uh, the previous speaker talked about. I'm not going to go back and do that. This system is also good because you can use it to- uh, uh, Melo, uh, please wrap up with one minute. Um, okay, I'm, I'm already there. This system is also good because you can also use it to start off from contaminated materials here to a point on the third one there where everything else is the blue that you want. So you can do quick uh, uh, line purification using that. So in short, your markers can confirm uh, that seed meets genetic purity standards. It can also identify selfing and external pollination. It can also show you the segregation that is going on there. It can also be used for variety verification it's also possible for single and, and the three-way crosses for you to, to, to do that. So the markers are able to do that. I've just restricted this presentation to QA, but the markers can do a lot more than what I've talked about here. It only leaves me to thank the team and the organization that has allowed me to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meluk, for the nice presentation uh, and uh for the nice uh, so giving us more methodological insights in the different types of molecular markers and its application quality assurance and quality control uh, yeah we know that uh, in your uh, side the application of molecular markers is quite high uh, we're expecting more than this actually but it seems that uh, everything is a secret and data uh, we want some practical data to be presented. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was a very nice presentation. And with that, I will pass to the next and the final presentation. Uh, finally, yet importantly, in the next 15 minutes, Dr. John Mark Robert, experienced system specialist in Africa, works through seed conditioning and its effect on quality. John is a managing director of Makush Seed, in Zimbabwe, we sell seeds in four different countries, including Zambia, DR Congo, Botswana, and South Africa, uh, including uh, the company's hosting country, Zimbabwe. John serves as a system specialist in Summit uh, for nine years and assists many emerging and established companies on business development, seed production, and variety release. Before joining Summit, John was the research and seed production manager at Circo Limited, now where Melu is coming, for five years. Over the last seven years, John has served as a consultant on seed business development in many different countries, specifically in East Africa uh, and Asian countries, uh, also in Netherlands and different international organizations. He is a very experienced seed system person in uh, the continent, uh, or uh, he's, he's serving the globe. John, I kindly invite you to start your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction um, and good. Thank you very much for the introduction. I trust you can hear me and uh, greetings to everyone who's participating. Uh, it's been a wonderful afternoon so far, um, a lot of good information shared. So I want to look at things slightly differently. Um, we uh, 
Sorry, I can't get my screen to work. Okay, there we go. Um, so a lot has been spoken about seed quality and um, why some of this, this information is not coming out. Okay, so the genetic um, quality of seed is obviously fixed for hybrids and self-pollinated and variable in OPBs. And that's largely determined during the growth of the crop. Uh, when we look at the analytical quality, uh, we're looking at the percentage of pure undamaged seeds of the variety. Uh, the physiological quality is related to the seed germination and vigor. Uh, the sanitary quality is about diseases and pests in the seed and uh, foreign seed, especially noxious weeds. And then finally, the chemical quality, which would be related to the, the seed treatment that might be applied to the seed. So when we look at what I'm going to present today, I'm mainly looking at these aspects uh, that can be affected by seed conditioning or seed processing. Um, the talks so far have mainly concentrated on the genetic quality, uh, the purity, and uh, the identity of your, your products. But we want to look at some of these things like um, analytical, physiological, sanitary, and chemical. Uh, there are a number of factors that affect the seed quality that comes out. Um, so I've mentioned that I really want to concentrate on this processing and packaging aspect of seed quality. Um, this is the sort of final stage of getting your seed ready for the farmer. And while there are um, standards for, for genetic and for uh, seed purity quality, um, really for a seed company, the concern is, is what the customer wants. Uh, what is the customer expecting when he opens a bag of seed? And of course, he expects that seed to be pure, true to type and uniform, but he also expects to see a, the, the product, the seed looking like uh, what he wants it to look like in terms of uh, utility and appearance and performance. Uh, in Zimbabwe and Southern Africa and parts of other in other parts of Africa, seed size grading is important uh, because farmers um, like to have a uniform seed. And in our experience, this is, is what I'm going to talk about. Um, how, how critical it is for the farmer. So this describes quickly how you um, size seed in terms of these that do size grade are not doing length grading, although in South Africa, that can be quite a, an important aspect. Uh, most companies are grading on width and thickness. So on width, you have a large, a medium, and a small size. You can also have an extra small. Um, and that's screened with round holes. And the sizes there are the whole sizes, 11 millimeter, nine and a half and eight millimeter. And then the thickness is graded with slotted screens, um, a five and a half millimeter and a six and a half millimeter. So we grade out according to the width, large, medium and small. And then we divide the thickness into two grades, um, flats and thicks and rounds. Uh, so the thicks and rounds, we, we combine them into one grade. Now, when you look at the seed physical analysis, uh, the Zimbabwe standards are pretty similar to most other uh, countries in Africa uh, and around the world. You, you generally require 99% pure seeds in your seed sample and a maximum of 3% defect seed. Within that defect seed, there are upper limits for things like insect or chip seed, germless seed, embryo damage seed, off types and disease seed. So the little diagram on the right there just shows the procedure that we do. We, we get our composite sample, we divide that. Um, we then have our purity seed test sample and that is uh, divided up into three portions, other seed, pure seed and inert matter. And then the pure seed is used to determine things like germination, vigor, seed weight, and seed health. And in that pure seed sample, like I mentioned, you have these different portions of uh, insect damage, uh, germless damage, and so on, seed. So we then, um, I wanna just show you some examples from our processing of seed. 
uh, and how important these components are. So this is a, a variety that came in. It, we call it Mutsa. It's a three-way hybrid. And the, the raw seed came in. And on the left there, you see the percentage of pure seed in the sample. Uh, um, the, the, sorry, what I should say here is that bar shows that there's 4% defects in the pure seed sample. OK? So there's 4% in the 99%, which is a defect seed. Now, <clears throat> that's made up of different components. So there's embryo damage seed, um, insect damage seed, and disease seed. So of that 4% in the raw seed, about 2% is embryo damage, and about 2% is disease seed, and a small proportion is insect damage. Then after seed size grading, so we, we put that seed through a, a cleaning machine. Um, it is briefly hand-picked on a, on a belt, and then it goes through the size grading machine. And you can see now that the, the proportion of defect seed uh, gets separated out into different grades. So the large flat at the bottom there, the large flat and the large thick rounds have mostly disease seed in them. The medium flats and the medium thick rounds have uh, a mixture of uh, the medium flats have sort of half half of disease and embryo damage seed. And uh, when you look at the small seed, the small flat and the small thick rounds, suddenly you're going up to seven, almost 8% of defect seed. Now you might ask, why is that? Well, the small seed is generally at the tips of the cob. Uh, and those are exposed to uh, the weather if the tips are a bit open and insect damage. And so you get quite a lot of damage to the embryo um, because of severe insect damage and then a fair amount of diseased uh, seed as well at the tips. So you can see now that um, our maximum allowance in Zimbabwe is 3% defect seed. So. Um, the medium flats and the small flats and small thick grounds are, are definitely very borderline uh, or rejecting or rejectable seed. Uh, so we had to handpick this. So we, we then handpicked the seed um, size by size. And you can see we get this down now to very acceptable levels of uh, seed purity and uh, percentage of defect seed. So everything now is around 1%. Now that is uh, acceptable in the market. Now you might ask, okay, what is the proportion of these different sizes in the sample? So this is what uh, came out. So nearly um, just over half, 60 odd percent of the seed is in the medium sizes, medium flats and medium thick rounds. So those are the middle portions of the cob. Uh, the small proportion, about 10 or so percent, is in the large section, and about 20 to 25 percent is in the small section. So, um, the, the point is here, uh, you know, how much effort should we put into um, hand picking those small seeds, uh, which are, have a very high defect rate in them, and to clean those? Uh, takes a lot of time uh, to, to handpick and to clean those small seeds uh, is, is timely and costly. But to handpick and to clean up the mediums is uh, very fast. Then I'll show you another example. This is um, a variety called ZS265. Again, it's a three-way hybrid. Uh, again, this seed came in, it was combined, and it came in with nearly 6% defects about half disease and half embryo damaged. Uh, the embryo damage came from the combining principally, and the disease seed came because it was a very wet season that we had. So after um, hand picking and seed size grading, this is what we get. Uh, so the large flats and the medium flats, after putting them through the machines are very clean and can go straight into uh, a bag basically. The large thick rounds, these are mostly at the bottom of the cob, and so they have a fair amount of disease. 
problems. And then the medium thick rounds and the small flats and small rounds, which are again at the closer to the tip of the cob, uh, have got a big problem as well from, from breakages and uh, diseases. So then we, we redid those and we put them back through the machines. And you can see that when we cycle the seed uh, a second time and a third time through the machines, the, the percentage of defect seed uh, decreases in the smalls. Um, but again, the problem with this is, that, is the time that it takes to, to rework the seed. And so when we look at the proportion of the seed that's in the sample, in the lot, about half of the lot, the half of that 40 tons that came in uh, is medium flats. And you can see the medium flats can, can go through the machines once and they are of an acceptable quality. Medium thick rounds uh, are another uh, 10 or 15 percent, and there's very small proportion of large seed there. So the small seed, the small flats and the small thick rounds, they constitute about 25 percent of the sample. Uh, and so is it worth the time and effort to clean up those small grades? doing as a company is we're putting all those smalls to the side for the moment and we will rework them later when when we have uh, the time and space to do that now what we also do in our company is we're monitoring our, our quality throughout the day while we are processing and this graph just shows you from 9 30 in the morning until uh, 14 45 in the afternoon uh, how the grading uh, varies through the day. Um, this is somewhat related to the operations of the machines, um, at the rate of feeding the machines, uh, the, the sample that's coming in and so on. So you can see there's, there's quite a lot of variation as you in the proportions of disease seed, insect or chip seed and embryo damaged seed. So this is um, what we consider a very important thing because if you just do one sample a day, uh, you might get... I think we've lost connection. Is it my network or we lost John? I think we've lost him. Let me wait him for some minutes, I want two minutes. Uh, my name is Walter Chawasa. Uh, I'll be leading you uh, in this session of uh, question and answer. Uh, I work for Stimit uh, based in Nairobi City Systems. Um, from the chat box, I didn't uh, have any questions. Uh, some of the questions have already been answered. Um, there was a question from uh, Ebenezer Abebe Tefera, and I think that question has been answered by Melu. Uh, I don't know, Adefera, how do you want us to proceed? Because there are no questions. Do you uh, want us to uh, ask from the audience, or are we? Yeah. Yeah, well, said. If all are addressed, actually, let me ask uh, Gabriela to activate the hands up and uh, speakers uh, microphones and uh, let uh, we let them ask us verbal questions. Leila. Yeah, and, and John, so John is, back, is back. John is back and if he can quickly finish his presentation. Okay. John? okay. That's great. That's great. Okay. John, please continue your presentation. Okay, sorry about that uh, internet instability there. No problem, please continue, it's Africa. Okay, yeah, so I'll try and qu quickly finish up. I'm just trying to get my screen back on. Okay, 
So like I said, we have uh, two teams, a quality team and a processing team, and they have to communicate to make sure that uh, the, they are meeting the quality standards, but also the output requirements. So our constant battle is quality versus quantity in the processing. But our maximum is quality must always trump quantity. So the, the quality team uh, can dictate or must dictate the, the rate of processing in order to meet and finally, just a quick look at seed treatment. And the aim is to obtain quality seed treated of a uniform color and correct chemical dosage. Um, there are three factors related here. There's the coverage, which is the evenness with which each seed is covered with a the chemical. Then the distribution of the chemical throughout the seed sample. And then the, the seed loading or the, the concentration of the chemical on the seed itself. Um, the, I won't go through this slide. Um, there's one aspect of seed treatment which is quite critical is because you're adding water to your seed, uh, you affect this final seed moisture. So in this example here, if your initial seed moisture is 12.5%, and you add 1% water, your, your moisture content goes to about 13.3%. Um, now that can be a problem, obviously, with the more water you apply, uh, the higher your final seed moisture content is, and that can certainly affect the, the store of that seed and so on. So in um, processing that part of the seed, Okay, uh, it seems that this is the last presentation, the last slide for the, his presentation and better to go to question and answer session if there are anything. Uh, Walter, we are almost out of time now. It is exactly two hours since we start and we are left with 10 minutes and if there is any Thing, uh, uh, two or three questions, please uh, go ahead with the question. Ask uh, the audience to raise their hand. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Uh, maybe the host can also unmute. Prasanna is saying uh, he has been un unmuted. But uh, currently, there is no uh, question. Uh, there are no questions in the chat box and also uh, in the. Yeah, no one is raising uh... his. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is one from uh, at Gonza. Uh, at Gonza. Please go ahead. Can you unmute yourself and uh, ask the question uh, briefly and straight to the point? Okay. Hello. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, we can hear. Uh, in the first, uh, yeah, in the first presentation, uh, I was uh, worried that there is a competition between the uh, public and the private. Uh, uh, yeah, as one of the challenges facing a private city business. But uh, again, at the same time, we say in most countries, we don't meet the, the demand yeah, because the production capacity of many, many actors is still low. Now, do we see this as a competition or just complement, they just complement each other and they may be what kind of, why don't we look at the modalities of improving this, uh, 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 increasing the access to, to farmers instead of, of thinking of that there is a competition? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe if you can mention where your question is directly um, directed to so that they will be able to uh, answer you properly. I think this is to Grace. Grace, yes. Okay, do we have, uh, okay, go ahead, Ms. Grace. Grace, get around. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. 
And uh, what uh, the experience is that, uh, you know, like in Africa, a lot of breeding is done by the private sector. So most of the seed companies has to rely on the private public sector to provide the foundation seed. So at times the competition is also sometimes becomes a challenge to, to effectively run your business. Secondly, where there is the, like where the regional or the CGRs are, are releasing materials for, the, for a region, it also becomes a challenge because the, 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 the modality or the system on, uh, on, uh, on uh, utilizing the varieties, you know, the exclusive and non-exclusive uh, system is not very well received. By, by, by the national authorities. So those are some of the challenges that we meant. It's, uh, it's not that uh, we cannot both of us learn. And uh, from the seed business, we expect the public sector to be more involved in facilitation, not uh, in doing business. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Grace, um, for the answer. I think um, at Gons I've been answered. Uh, I don't see any other question. I think a difference we can continue to the next session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Walter, for uh, uh, managing this session. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with this, the webinar come to an end and humbly invite Walter Chivasa, Simit African Sea System Coordinator, to close the webinar. But before Walter start to speak, on behalf of the organizing committee and myself, may I take this opportunity to thank first, importantly, the invited speakers for accepting the invitation and make such a marvelous presentation and narration. Also for CIMIT scientists, the two CIMIT scientists uh, who uh, gave us their experience and insights uh, with full of uh, datas, uh, data. Uh, also for a uh, global mess program and uh, AGG project management staff for their all round support. And finally for CIMIT communication and knowledge management team for designing the webinar flyer and fa uh, facilitation the Zoom meeting. Uh, then Walter, please uh, close the meeting. Uh, I, um, and this is uh, what I want to say. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Adephris, uh, for uh, coordinating the webinar. I think uh, we managed to get a lot of insights in uh, QAQC. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the presenters, uh, both internal summit and also our resource persons uh, who managed to put up the uh, presentation uh, uh, during their biz schedule, and also give us a very high quality presentations. I thank you very much. Uh, please uh, don't uh, get tired to continue to come to you to uh, request your expertise or best. Uh, thank you very much for the quality presentation and also time management. Uh, the time management was very good, your presentation is uh, concise and precise in a short time, but we didn't want to um, hold our, our audience, um, um, the participants for a long time. Uh, just a quick one, I don't have to repeat the presentation, but uh, there were a few, a few uh, take home messages which we got from our presenters, for example, from uh, AFSTA. Uh, we saw that uh, the maintenance of pallet is key to realize the return on investment and also you satisfy your farmers. Uh, Manje and my colleague James, they also uh, touched us and also they indicated that you don't need to have a lab for you to do QAQC. You can outsource uh, the service. The services are now available, which you can outsource. And our colleague, uh, Godfrey, uh, he also showed us uh, that uh, if you don't monitor your quality, you give farmers a lot of seed with poor quality. You can see that uh, 56 to 60, that it was a range between nearly uh, 56 to 60 uh, pass rate, which means uh, between uh, 45 and 38% uh, 
uh, contaminated sands which are ending up with the farmers. So we really need to have a game in terms of QC. Uh, and also from Melu, uh, you also uh, indicated that uh, the genes don't lie. Now we only rely on morphological, uh, give farmers the quality. He showed us that uh, he quality extends beyond genetic purity, but also you need uh, excellent seed conditioning for you to uh, give farmers seed that will uh, enable them to uh, realize the genetic gain uh, after seed conditioning in terms of uh, grading, removing uh, uh, defects and the like. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you once again. Uh, we uh, provide the presentations to all the participants, uh, including the audio. So thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Adephis. Thank you very much. I almost finished. Uh, uh, and thank you to the participants for uh, making this event possible, uh, like um, uh, coming in great number. Uh, we'll continue uh, a similar webinar in the future. And uh, good night, good day, wherever you are. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>